How do we know about these magnetic excursions? As a geologist, we use proxy data. But many people out there that are laymen have no idea what we're talking about when we use proxy data. In fact, unlike models in climate science where they just make things up, proxy data is based on direct observation of sediments, fossils, magnetism in minerals, and other directly observed phenomena that make proxy data 100% provable, correlative, and extremely important to uncovering true climate science, especially paleoclimate, which is ancient climate. Now we use these proxies to determine the magnetic excursions as well as direct measurements of the magnetic field in sedimentary rocks as well as volcanic rocks. While this may be difficult to understand for many people, this video tonight will hopefully open your eyes to many of the proxies that we use to uncover the facts that we bring to you. Now this is all extremely important because of the cosmic clock cycle, which many people know of as the Yuga cycle. But what has been determined in the last few decades is that all of the cosmic climate events fall on this clock cycle. In fact, it's a 26,000 year cycle with a flexure point at 13,000 years where also catastrophes happen. And then again, a flexure point at 6,500 years as it ticks along. It takes names, well, and it causes mass extinctions and the disruption of our planet. And this has been ongoing as far back as we look. Now let's talk about the geomagnetic reversal. A lot of people refer to it as a pole flip, when in fact it is not a pole flip in any way. The planet doesn't flip upside down. A geomagnetic reversal is a change in the planet's magnetic field. Nothing more. And in fact... The latest magnetic reversal, complete reversal, the Brunus Matayama reversal here, occurred 780,000 years ago. So what are all these magnetic excursions? Well, they're not true polar reversals. And what we mean by that is that the North and South Pole don't flip completely. They just approach the equator and they get a little, well, haywire. So the planet is not flipping upside down. That's science fiction. There's no geologic evidence that that ever happened in the last few hundred million years, a planetary flip. Something like that would be so catastrophic that it would probably and potentially end all life on Earth. If not, send our, sending our planet cascading off into the abyss. But the magnetic field shifts regularly and we bring this to you all the time. And this is called the known magnetic excursions. And we're going to talk about that first. What you're looking at is the last 800,000 years on Earth. And the inferred, the inferred through proxy data, magnetic field strength of our planet. And you can see that it ebbs and flows. It goes up and down. And there's this baseline here, which... Below is a very low field intensity where bad things happen, mass extinctions, in fact. The last one was the end of the Neanderthal. There was also the Blake extinction, the Pringle Falls extinction, the Lost Emperor, the Cambrian Ridge extinction, the Delta extinction, and then the Brunus Matayama, the big one. This is an actual full switch of North and South Pole. But look how close we got here just 180,000 years ago, and again, 42,000 years ago. Very low, that zero point, where the field may flip. And once again, we're going into that once again. Now, how do we know this or measure field intensity? Well, one thing we use is rock magnetism. The magnetic properties of rocks are mostly caused by the presence of ferromagnetic minerals or natural ferrites in the rocks. And the most common is magnetite. The ferromagnetic properties observed in the rocks depends on the minerals present 
their concentration, the grain size, and the values of the magnetic parameters of the rocks vary over several orders, from weakly magnetic, sedimentary, metamorphosed, and igneous rocks to strongly magnetic, basic igneous, and metamorphosed rocks, to pure magnetite and other ores. And the intensity of the magnetic field at the Earth's surface is a function of the location of the observation point in the primary Earth's magnetic field, as well as from contributions from local or regional variations of magnetic materials such as magnetite. Now, that's a lot to say, but <laughs> if we're looking at a sedimentary rock that hasn't moved ever, and we know the current magnetic field, and we can measure a magnetic field in the rock that's different, then we know the change in the magnetic field over time if we know the age of the rock. I hope that made it simpler for you. Now, the most common magnetic mineral is magnetite. And after you correct for the effects of Earth's natural magnetic field, magnetic data can be presented as total intensity, relative intensity, and vertical or horizontal gradient anomaly profiles on certain maps and graphs. And then we get things like this. A magnetic field intensity over time, as more data comes in, this graph gets higher and higher resolution. In recent papers, it's gotten so high resolution that we can directly correlate dips in the magnetic field to mass extinctions in hominids, like the Neanderthal, and many other megafauna. These revelations have only come in the last few years, where we have direct links here on the right side, geomagnetic field intensity, to extinction events. The Lachamp excursion, the field intensity went very low, and the Neanderthals went extinct. The Neanderthals were not the only hominids to go extinct. There were many other lineages, like Homo sapien sapien and versions of that, that flourished after that point, and many others that ended. If we come to the Iceland Basin extinction event, there are other fauna that end at these excursion events. Here we see a dip and the beginning of a new fauna. So not only do we have mass extinction, due to field intensity shifts, but we have speciation, the beginning of new species. So magnetic field excursions cause extinctions and speciation at the same time. This is probably due to huge influxes of cosmic rays on our planet, the only thing we know that can mutate the genome. Now a paper coming out this year Sea surface characteristics of the Newfoundland Basin, a 145,000-year study based on sedimentological and paleontological proxies is an amazing paper for us to dissect tonight because this paper hits on some of the proxy data that we want to get you more familiar with. Now, dramatic changes occur in the sea surface characteristics, temperature and salinity, and freshwater input due to the interactions of cold and fresh currents in many regions in the world, and this affects the biome. And one of the most important precursors in the biome is benthic foraminifera and diatoms. Now, if you have no idea what I just said, calm down. Benthic foraminifera and diatoms are the most important proxy data for sedimentologists like myself. Now, foraminifera are single-celled protistas, and diatoms are single-celled algae, both of which can form a siliceous covering which protects them forever. And because they're so small, they're extremely sensitive. Well, let's just read what they have to say here in this paper, May 29th, 2020. Among benthic microorganisms, these are microorganisms that when they die, fall to the bottom, and that's benthic. Diatoms and foraminifera are of great importance 
in aquatic ecosystems worldwide because one, their species react in a rapid and sensitive way to environmental changes in water bodies, and two, they preserve in sediments for time immemorial due to their shells, which are made of silica, as in the form of diatoms, or calcium carbonate cemented silica, detrital material. So foraminifera cement together sand to form their shell, and they do it in shallow coastal ecosystems, coastal lagoons and marshes, which make the foraminifera and diatoms extremely valuable for both ecology and geology because modern communities indicate dynamic transitions between land and marine habitats. And fossil assemblages record past sea level changes and climatic shifts. You're looking at diatoms and foraminifera. They're gorgeous. And they, in fact, just look like tiny seashells. But in order to see them, you have to use a microscope. This, again, is another example of plasma scaling in the electric universe. Things at the microscopic level mimic things at the macroscopic level. This looks exactly like a nautilus. This as well. This is a nautiloid formed by sand grains that the protista made its shell. The foraminifera did this. And many of these look like clams or other things we would see in the macroscopic world. Yet, these are all under microscope. Here's more foraminifera. They're tiny, encrusted cases made of microscopic silica grains cemented with calcium carbonate. Absolutely fantastic. And they are one of the most important ecological indicators that give us, well, graphs like this. Thank you, guys. Because if it wasn't for them, we would have no basis in claiming that you are now living on the next flexure point of the next cosmic catastrophe. And the data actually shows it from this paper. So we're going to dive into it real quick before we end the video. Now here's the data set. So let's blow it up real quick. Now, before we get started, if you come up to the top of figure five here, it's going to tell you what A, B, C, D through I are. And these are the data points here. A, B, C, D, E through I on the left axis. The graphs are through time for each of these points from zero today through 160 kilo years ago. And what they have striped on this map are all of the events that are known magnetic excursions. We'll get to that. And these are all of the events that are also on the cosmic clock cycle. Any one of these flexure points falls directly on this cosmic catastrophe cyclic clock where we're living the next one, all of them. Heinrich event one, Heinrich event two, Heinrich event three, which they didn't include right there. Heinrich event four, Heinrich event five, MIS four, C21, H11. These graphs are not particularly scientific, they're simply foraminifera graphs, most of them, where they're collecting the foraminifera in the sediment and they are determining through their abundance what's going on or other data. But when scientists do this in basin after basin worldwide, hemisphere, northern, southern, Eastern, Western, these graphs all correlate for the most part. Some areas, there's less effects. But if we have the more proxy data we get, the more these graphs match up. Like you see them all matching up here from the same basin using different biological creatures. Different types of foraminifera were looked at, and they all responded in a positive or negative way at the same time. 
which directly correspond to, guess what? This clock cycle and known magnetic excursions. That's how we do the science. That's why we're warning you of what's happening right now. It's not happening tomorrow. It could. It's not happening next year. It may. But it's happening in your lifetime. A major shift in everything you know about life on this planet is about to happen and is happening now. based on everything we know in the past. If we don't learn from what happened in the past, well, we will repeat the same thing in the future. Com complete annihilation, destruction of information, and, well, you know where we're at. Are you prepared for what's coming? If you want to support the channel, and you want peace of mind, come over and check out My Patriot Supply. Keep your freedom. Support your family. Investing in an emergency food supply for when there is a collapse is the right decision. And that's a boom to knowledge. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. I hope you got something out of the video. It was kind of paleo climatology 101 tonight with a little bit of magnetism. Share this with like-minded people. If you have any questions, leave them below. And we'll see you soon. And that's a boom. Be safe. We love you. Subscribe to the channel. Become a Patreon. And share this video. Ding, ding, ding.